Good morning. Sorry, forgot about the Zoomers. Uh, just so we're on day two with Galen Emanuel, which I think provides us a little fun and some deep thinking at the same time. I will confess to being one of those people yesterday who was totally terrified when he said we would actually have to do something. Um, and I'm sure many of you felt the same way. But I left um, with, a, with a lot of thoughts and challenges for myself. And um, I'm hopeful to leave with that same package of goods today. Galen, take it away. Hello, good morning, friends. Uh, yeah, excited to be back. Who was there yesterday? Okay, great, a smaller group of people. Who was not there yesterday? Okay, great, well, hello, welcome. Uh, good. Yep, a lot of things. So we're going to cover uh, a number of things today. If you were here yesterday, then this like it will build on some of the things we talked about. If you were not there yesterday, that's okay. You, you, um, we're not, you're not going to be lost uh, on what we do. But we're going to talk about just a few things today. Um, one of them about like building a culture of feedback, I think uh, speaking about that and, and sharing with some like, there's something I want to share with you I think is like a very practical, this is for teams to kind of take away, it's a, it's a very tangible kind of like, how can we do feedback better in a like peer-to-peer -peer sense that I think is like really, I'm excited about. It's like one of the newest like pieces of content that I have and I love it. I think it's really, really helpful. So I'm um, talking about building culture of feedback and some other just dynamics of culture, how we operate together, how we sort of impact each other, and, and just what it means to be part of a team, et cetera. So um, yeah, I'm excited. Today uh, is going to be, uh, we're going to have a mix of sort of like activities. I always like to kind of keep it active and have people engage and do things instead of me just having slides and lecturing and talking about stuff. So um, anyways, good morning. Hello. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is, um, is, is a, it sort of builds on yesterday, but it also is a, a really nice kind of like transition into us talking about feedback and stuff. So the first thing that I want to do, and we're just going to kind of like dive right into this, so um, it's just here we go. Uh, but for the first first thing we're going to do, uh, I would love everyone to like grab a partner. Um, and so for this, I know yesterday we, we did a couple act activities where it was okay to have a group of three, and ideally for this first thing that we're going to do, it's ideal that we don't have any groups of three. So like uh, just try to find an individual partner if you can. If, if we have an odd number of people total, then a group of three is fine, but uh, everyone just grab a partner, make a new friend, somebody close by to you, uh, and I'll explain what we're going to do. And if you're looking for a partner, put a hand up so that we go, yeah. Right here, right here. Oh, okay. We your partners now. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, does anyone else not have a partner? Is everybody partnered up? Okay. We're good. Um, Yay. And I would say this too, as people like uh, sort of trickle in, hello, um, is uh, grab somebody, just jump into a group of three, you're totally fine. Um, but if somebody else comes in, uh, you have to hunt them down and grab them and ha so that you're a partner. Yep, you're fine, everything's great. Um, but uh, good, because this, d this does work in a group of three, um, but it's a little bit slower. So um, just as a group of three back there, don't dawdle. And if somebody else jumps in, just like find them, bring them in. So, okay. Groovy. Oh, cool. Great. You got Brian. Okay. Um, lovely. Cool. So I will say this. As people come in, just because I always feel bad as a facilitator, somebody comes in and then they just have to watch the rest of the exercise. So like as a group of two, if somebody walks in and they don't know what they're doing, grab them, bring them over to you, sort of just jump them into what you're doing so that no one has to wait for the exercise. Is that okay? Um, all right. Great. Here we go. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, fantastic. So, here's what you're going to do uh, for this activity. And, um, yeah, so first, as we get into this, and uh, what I want you to do is everyone's going to do something for themselves individually first, which is I want you to think of excluding dogs and cats. So no household pets, no dogs, no cats. Um, but I want you to think of your favorite animal in the world, um, something exotic, a rhinoceros, whatever, something you think is the best animal in the world. Um, you're, no one's going to have to like 
uh, act like they're animal or do anything weird or corny. Um, but we're going to use this as subject matter for this, this activity. And we have a couple rounds of this activity that we're going to do. And you're going to keep the same animal for yourself as we go through round two, round three. So um, just want to say that I'm stalling to give you enough time to think of an animal. Um, and sometimes, I also say for the purpose of this exercise, I think it's more effective if you pick something that you're actually convicted that you think is like the best animal, like an awesome animal. Um, it's okay, but every once in a while someone will be like, I couldn't think of something, so I just said squirrel, which is fine. No shade on squirrels, they're fine. Uh, but just if you think of something like, just something you think is actually awesome. It doesn't have to be real. It can be unicorn, I don't care. Um, but just have this for yourself. So here's what you're gonna do with your partner. Um, so uh, what is your name? Roberts. Okay, if Robert is my partner for this activity, here's what we're going to do. Um, so if he goes first, he's person A, I'm person B. Um, Robert will say to me these kind of exact words, I think the best animal in the world is a blank. So whatever he picked, let's say he picked a penguin. Uh, he would say, I think the best animal in the world is a penguin, period. Full stop, that's it. And then I will respond like this. I would say, uh, no, I disagree. It's not the best animal in the world. And then I would give two reasons why it's not the best animal in the world. I can say anything I want. So I might be like, no, I disagree. Penguins aren't the best animal in the world. Penguins can't fly, which is lame for birds. Uh, and they live in cold climates, so we never get to like hang out with them or see them very often. So that's it. Done. And then we trade places. The other person goes. So now it's my turn to go. I would say, I think the best animal in the world is a giraffe. Let's say that's what I picked. Um, and then uh, Robert will respond the exact same way. No, I disagree. Two reasons why it's not done. So once both of us have gone once with our one animal, it would be great if everyone like put a hand up so I know which teams are done, who still needs a little bit more time. Um, again, if you have a group of three, just you're fine. Just like don't dawdle. Uh, just you know, be be snappy with it. Um, cool. Does that make sense? Uh, quick again, just s instructions one more time, just because for people to be clear. So. Person A, I think the best animal in the world is a blank. Person B, no, I disagree. Two reasons why it's not, and then trade. Once both of us have gone, hands up so that I know who's done. Okay, go ahead, give a shot. Okay. Great, great, great. Uh, that looks like everybody. So um, cool, cool, cool. Uh, right. So we're going to switch, uh, kind of like progress here. So um, we're going to do round two. And round two looks like this. So now Robert is the same partner for me. He will have the same animal uh, as well. And this time the we're going to tweak the response. So this time Robert will say, if he goes first, I think the best animal in the world is a penguin. Uh, and then my response will be like this. I will say, no, I disagree. It's not the best animal in the world. Um, but I'll name one thing about it that's great uh, and one way that it could be improved. Um, instead of the two reasons why it's not. So, right? So, and I can, again, I can say anything I want. So I'll be like, no, I disagree. Penguins aren't the best animal in the world, but uh, they're, they look great. They look sharp. But they're like little outfits. Like they, they look really sharp. Uh, and, if, and they would be better if they could fly. Um, and then my turn, right? I'll keep the same animal for myself. I think the best animal in the world is a giraffe. Robert will have the same response. No, I disagree. But here's one thing about it that's awesome. Uh, one way it could be improved. Once both of us have gone, hands up, uh, you're done. So give it a shot.
Okay, wonderful. Um, great, that looks like everybody. So round three, final round. Uh, for this, this time we're going to tweak the response for the third time. Uh, so like this. So Robert goes first again. He says, I think the best animal in the world is a penguin, and I will respond with these words exactly out of my mouth. Tell me more about that. And he will say why he thinks a penguin is the best animal in the world. Once he's done, my turn, I will say, I think the best animal in the world is a giraffe. He will say these exact five words out of his mouth. Tell me more about that. And I will say why I think a giraffe is the best animal in the world. Once both of us are done, hands up. Um, that's it. Go ahead. Tell me more about that. Go for it. Okay. Groovy. Okay, great. That looks like most everybody. Um, so, yeah, let's take a moment. I kind of want to like, uh, I have a question. We'll like sort of like unpack this, debrief with this activity a little bit. Um, but I'm curious to hear first, just in general, observations, thoughts, feelings. How did it feel to have your partner ask you uh, about your animal and get to say what you thought about your animal versus hear what your partner thought about your animal um, in that version of that? And like any, uh, I'm not looking for like a correct answer. I'm just curious, like observations, feelings, how did that feel? What did you notice? What did you observe? Um, just in general. Uh, and like maybe starting with just like, how did that feel like to get to say what you thought about your animal? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Just like a different perspective, different way to like think about it. Thank you. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. He felt like just he was really listening, tuned in. Um, great. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Can you tell me more about that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can of worms, can of worms. Okay, uh, but it felt good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, totally. Sure. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. But yeah, just feeling like home, welcome, like just in a place of ease and like comfortable to share, to right, to be vulnerable, to share something about yourself. And um, yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. There was a hand up here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, awesome. Also, something interesting I want to point out, this is not, it's not uh, anything, but you're like, when he had to agree with it, all he did was say, tell me more about that. 
but it's interesting, your interpretation of that was that he agreed with you. Um, but when like, uh, right? But like, um, what an interesting observation. You're like, well, we had to agree with it. But he was just like, well, tell me more about that. But it feels like, right, without the first two pieces of like counter this, know this, da, da, da. Um, interesting. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, any other thoughts, observations, either in like asking and listening or, yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah. And I, uh, <laughs> so there's an element of that of like being vulnerable, right? It's like somebody wanted to be like, hey, let me have some insight into like you sharing with me, right? Similar in that thing of like, well, okay, um, great. Yeah. Love it. Uh, yes. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, great. Yeah. Why are you wasting your time? She asked me. That. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think like a couple, couple things there too. Who felt like they learned something about the animal that was there? But also who felt like they learned something about their partner? Yeah, interesting, right? Like their connection to it or why they like it or, or whatever kind of thing like also gives us more insight into them. So um, great. I want to just take a moment. I appreciate Thank you guys for sharing your comments. Um, I want to take a moment and unpack this. And all the context of what we're doing today, I know we kind of like jumped right into it. I've got a lot of stuff I want to cover that I think is really valuable. So I'm like, let's just rock. Um, but all of these things, I think, really kind of speak to how do we show up together, right? Building on like yesterday as well. How do we impact each other? How do we respond to one another? What does it feel like to be here? And so much in our communication, in our response to each other has, is that, right? The heart of that. Do I feel at home? Do I feel welcome? Do I feel like my partner cares about me? Do, right? Do I feel listened to? All those things. Um, and this exercise to me is, is there's like some really profound things here that I think are important for us to be intentional about as we move through interacting with human beings and the relationships that we have um, across the board. And so, you know, to, to unpack this activity a little bit, round one of this exercise is what I think most communication between human beings uh, takes place. It's that two people trading statements back and forth. This is what I think, this is what I think, this is my opinion. Nobody asks questions, nobody's listening. You don't even have to be here, um, right? It's just like, this is my opinion of this thing. And round two of this exercise feels more positive. Right? Because in round two, I'm like, well, penguins aren't the best animal in the world, but here's something great about them, and here's how they can be improved. Right? It feels like a more positive conversation. But there's still a trap there that I think is really important to be conscious of, and, and that is this. Even though round two feels more positive, all the communication coming from me is about me. I don't care what you think of penguins. This is what I think of penguins. They're great. They suck. They could be improved this way. Da -da. You don't even have to be here. I could just record a podcast and have you listen to it. Like, right? It's not a conversation. It's not dialogue. Right? It's just my opinion that I'm like giving to you. And in round three of this exercise is a place where a conversation can actually take place. Right? Where I have the opportunity to gain something that I can only gain in one individual way, which is your perspective and where you're coming from, right? to hear from you. Uh, and I think it's such an important thing for us to be aware that like, that's where our conversations take place. In a place where I am asking questions, I'm listening, I'm understanding because I like. I can say everything I want, I can have the opinions in the world that I want, but the only thing I cannot gain by assuming is what you actually think in your perspective. And I think it's so important for us to be able to be aware of being in that place. And there's a couple places that are really critical for that, right? And that's when um, conversations are like sticky. And so yesterday we spent a lot of time talking about saying yes and saying yes to other people's ideas. But also, what if somebody shares an idea that you think is stupid, right? What if somebody shares an idea that is that's not feasible, that you think is the worst idea they've ever heard? How do we respond to that, right? And so I think still under that umbrella of yes and, and like wanting to like say yes, to listen, right, to make people look good, um, all those things, uh, I think it's really important that we're in that space of like being curious and asking and listening. So for an example, right, let's say that Robert comes to me, right, with an idea that I think is terrible. Maybe he's like, okay, Galen, I've got this idea. I think we should take the whole team like camping together over the weekend and do this like, like let's go camping over the weekend with the whole team and do this team, right? And like I can think of a hundred reasons why that is a terrible idea. Like, People in tents in the woods in the weekends, an HR nightmare, um, right? It's not like people have kids, they won't, it's not accessible. Like there's a lot of reasons why I'm like, that's a really terrible idea for us to do. But if I fire back at him and no, we can't do that, here's all the reasons why not, two things happen. Number one, he feels shut down. No, we can't do that, here's all the reasons why not. And number two, and this is subtle, and it happens more often than we realize, 
is that when I do that, I risk saying no to the wrong idea. And what I mean by that is that if I were to ask some questions instead, why do you like that idea? Tell me more about that. Where are you coming from? Like, why do you like the idea of us going camping, even though I think it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, um, right? What I might uncover in the process is that the reason that Robert thinks that's a good idea is because we don't really get to spend a lot of time as a team outside. It'd be nice to like get outside, get some fresh air, and do something that has nothing to do with work, and just like bond and like get to know each other. If that's the reason he thinks camping in the woods over the weekend is a good idea, there are literally a hundred ways that we could accomplish that same goal that aren't camping in the woods over the weekend, right? And so instead of saying no and shooting down this idea, that, like that's an idea, that's a solution or like an objective that I could very easily, with a very small amount of effort, find a very easy way to say yes to, right? To make that happen. But if I don't ask the question, not only does he feel shut down, but like we don't find the solution that is available to us. And like it's just as simple as asking. Um, of like, tell me more about that. Just to be in a space of like, why do you like that idea? Where are you coming from? And I think another place that that's important is like in conflict, right? Or static, where we like disagree or we have some kind of issue with one another. Uh, <coughs> let's, similar scenario, right? Whatever else, let's say that Robert comes to me and he's upset, right? He's like, yeah, oh, and like, right? We have some conflicts. Again, I hate working with your department. You guys are miserable. You guys are terrible. I cannot stand working with you guys, right? And like, what happens, I think, in most situations like that, right? Somebody comes to me, they're upset, they have some accusation of like, I'm the worst leader, our department is terrible or whatever. I think this is like 95% of the response to that is like, we're not terrible, you guys are terrible. You have no idea how busy we are, da, da, da. You're the ones who blah, 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 blah. We're back to round one of that activity. Two people trading statements. This is my opinion, right? We're trying to like win here. And I, I dare you, I challenge you as a human being to have the like wherewithal, the like emotional tension, the like just the courage in your life. When somebody comes to you to be like, hey, this, this, you're the worst department or whatever, I dare you to have the courage to just respond to that person by saying, tell me more about that. Where are you coming from? Why? What's the heart of that? What's going on for you? Um, right? Because again, what I will uncover in the process of that is the reason that if the only thing I know from Robert is that he can't stand my department, he thinks we're terrible. I can't do anything to fix that. I'm not going to change everything about my department in the hopes that one of those things and right like changes. But if I ask the question, the reason he might not like working with my department is because we're swamped beyond belief. So when he sends me an email, it's low priority for me, right? It goes to the bottom of my pile. He might have to wait two or three days to get an answer back from me, or he might chase that email two or three times to be like, I need an answer. He might have work that's bottlenecked that can't move forward until he hears back from me. That's a legitimate reason to be like, I can't stand working with your department, right? Um, and if I understand what that is, then there's an opportunity for us to like actually move through that and find a solution. Um, but if I don't ask the question, if I don't listen, if I don't go to the place of like, tell me more about that, let me understand where you're coming from. Like, it makes it really, really nearly impossible to like resolve static, resolve conflict right away at the source, right? Um, and the thing is that we're naturally very good at this when it comes to customer service. If we have a student or a parent or some, right, a customer on the phone and they're upset with us, you're, you're never gonna be like, you're the idiot that doesn't know how to use a website, right? We're never gonna do that because we, that relationship, right, we care about, we want that person's business, their money, right? We want that relationship to matter. But a lot of times when it's like at work or it's personal, all that goes out the window. We are capable of being in a place of like, hey, I'm sorry that's happening for you. Let's figure out what happened. Let's make it right, like, right? Like, we can fix this, let's solve this, like, let's go, right? We have this, we have the ability to be gracious, right? And put the relationship first and move through that together. But when it comes to work things and like, right, we don't have, the, th the same thing is not at stake in terms of wanting to preserve that relationship to like do business as a customer, but like we're capable of that. And I think it's really important. I also think it tell me more about that is like one of the most valuable tools and skills that you can have as a human being. It gives you a moment to like pause, listen, reflect before you have to respond just to be like, what do you mean? Tell me more like about where you're coming from. Um, it's an awesome way to like diffuse a maybe like emotionally heightened situation as well. Just be like, hey, right, keep talking. I just, I just share with me. I want to understand what's going on for you here so that we can find a solution or move through this together. Um, yeah, a couple things. I think that as human beings, we are like opinion machines. I think we're convinced at every single moment that everybody needs to hear our opinion, and like, that's actually not the case. Um, and like, it, it is really helpful for us to understand, right, with some discretion, you will always have an opinion, but like when and where or not to share it is like a very like critical skill for yourself in terms of your own self-awareness and your emotional intelligence with other people. Um, and you know, we also suck at conflict. 
generally, like collectively, really, right? For like, and also for pretty good reason. I don't know about all of you. But most of us come from like broken homes. Our parents didn't know anything about conflict except how to model it in the most unhealthy way, right? And then you go to school, kids are mean. It's like, hey, it's a cruel world, good luck. <laughs> And then you grow up and you get a job and you work with a bunch of other people who have their own weird damage with conflict and dysfunction where, right, when we have static, we have conflict, it's either that we avoid it at all costs. People say there's absolutely nothing wrong when like something is clearly wrong. We tell everyone in the world about this thing or this person that drives us crazy and what's going on except the person that can actually fix it for us, right? Or we treat conflict like war. It's battle, we like armor up and think of things to say. Or we have angry conversations with people in our head when they're not there, right? <laughs> right? Where we put them in their place and like, you'll say this, and I'll say that, and like, like, right? So by the time that we actually have a conversation with that person, we're upset for things that they said to us in a made up conversation where like right where they say the meanest possible things and we respond with like this like uh this you know it's like ah, we suck at conflict and how lovely would it be to know that if you or i or anybody in this room had some static between the two of us that immediately you could go right to that person and be like hey things don't feel great you know i'm upset you're whatever let's talk through this you go first right where are you coming from i think it's like such a valuable thing imagine of the people in your life that you have the most static with or who are the most difficult to have a real conversation with or navigate feedback or whatever, if you knew with 100% certainty, you could go to that person saying, hey, I'm having this experience, I'm very upset, I'm frustrated, or this thing you dealt like is upset, and you knew with 100% certainty that person would respond by being like, hey, tell me more about that. I'm sorry that's happening, let's talk through this, right? And like wanna resolve that with you. How lovely would that be, right? If you think about like some of the like challenging people in your life to know that. Well, you can't make other people be like that, but guess what? You can be like that. You can be the person, as a leader, as a colleague, as a human being, as a friend, to be like, you can say anything to me, and I will receive it well. And I think that's a gift for you, for the other people in your life, to know that, like, hey, it's okay if you're, if you're having an experience of me in some way that is less than awesome, and it's bothering you, you can come and tell me about that, and I will receive it well, right? And then my first initial response is always going to be, tell me more about that, where are you coming from? Um, I think it's just a powerful thing and something to be conscious and aware of. I know this exercise is like goofy with the animals, but I really think like being just aware of like stay in round three, stay in that tell me more about that, being curious, listening, whether we have static conflict, somebody shares an idea that you don't like. We don't have to pretend that we like ideas that we don't. We don't have to say yes to things that we don't like, um, but to move through that, to be like, hey, tell me more about that. And also it can be done with some levity. If anyone on my team comes to me with an idea and I respond by saying, tell me more about that, they know that I hate their idea. <laughs> but there's an understanding there, right? In that honestly, earnestly, as a leader, as a colleague of my team, is that like what I'm saying to them is like, I don't initially love that idea and I'm not gonna pretend that I do, but I'm willing to hear you out. I would love to get your perspective. Why do you like that idea? Why do you see the benefit of that, right? Like, I don't know everything. I don't see everything. And other people have different perspectives. And so just like with, I also like octopuses, but like this, octopi, um, but like this perspective was a different way for me to look at it. It's like my team knows that no matter what, even if I don't like their idea, I will always hear them out. I will always make them feel listened to. And that's such a vital thing that you can do to build trust, to build a better relationship, right? To, to build an environment where you know you can bring anything to me. Whether I like it or not, I'll respond in a way that puts the relationship first, that doesn't make you feel shut down, right? And like that's such a that's such a gift and it's something that you can adopt and bring with you in your life, to your personal relationships, your work relationships, to be like, this is true for me. You can say anything to me, even if you say it imperfectly, and I will receive it well. Um, because this relationship matters to me more than my ego, right? And like, that's really what it comes down to. So, um, cool, all right, great. We're gonna switch gears, but I think that's kind of a nice transition into this next piece of talking about, uh, talking about feedback, so um, good. Do people like that? Does that resonate? Does that feel like there's something there for you to kind of take away? That's always my hope, is that like there's some nuggets, there's some piece of reflection about like how can I apply this? What does that mean for me uh, in my own life? So, all right, good. We're just racing through. We got only so much time. I could spend all day with you guys. I've got so much to talk about. So, all right, um, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna transition a little bit here and talk about um, building a culture of feedback. Got it, look at that. Booyah! Um, so, uh, yeah, and what I want to share here, I think feedback is critical. When we talk about culture, when we talk about teams, we talk about relationships across the board and any of any type, 
I think feedback is like the single most easiest way that is like also the least expensive way to like build trust, build rapport, improve, um, right? To build better relationships. Uh, also to eliminate unnecessary conflict and static um, because you know when we can have conversations about the things that we need to talk about or give feedback or receive feedback, in their infancy, right? When we can talk about things right when they happen, when they're small, they don't escalate into something bigger. Um, and my like favorite thing to say about that is, it's much easier to blow out a match than it is to put out a forest fire. Uh, and when we can address things right when they happen, right when they bother us, or right when they right, address things in the moment, directly at the source, um, it's such a benefit. And the one thing I think that doesn't get talked about enough when it comes to feedback, because I think truly for any organization or team, Feedback done well is like, it's, it's such a benefit to the culture of that, to what those relationships look like. It's the like, it's just, it's such a healthy thing. Um, and I, what I don't think it's talked about enough when we talk about feedback is that more than just improvement or like I'm giving you feedback and you're illuminating blind spots and learning and growing and we're improving together is that like feedback to me is the single most powerful, real authentic way to have trust and build better relationships between two people. Because if you know, where I know that I can go to Jose and say anything. I can give any kind of feedback to him, even if I'm nervous about how he'll respond to it, right? But I know that no matter what I say, no matter what I come to him with, our relationship will never be at stake, right? That like he will respond to it well, that we can navigate through that, even if we have conflict or difficulty with each other. But I know and I trust that like you and I can move through that together and it won't damage our relationship. Like that builds such a, uh, such a feeling of like, okay, now we actually can trust each other, right? That we can say what we need to say when we need to say it, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and I think that's such a, it's so powerful. And like there really isn't, anything that qualifies like that as much as, as, as that. Because it doesn't matter if it's a like personal friendship, work relationship, romantic relationship. It's like the ability to be able to say what we need to say to that person and have that not damage the relationship is, is critical to me. So, um, good. And what my hope is here with talking about this feedback stuff is to sort of like shift your relationship with feedback. Because I think also a lot of times feedback is done inside organizations as just a way to deliver criticism, right? It's just, it's a mechanism for like, this is what's going wrong. And so, and also, it often only comes top down, right? So we just like, feedback comes from somebody with a position of authority or power over you, gives you feedback, and then you can do that to people below you, which is really weird. It's really weird. Uh, if feedback is how we learn and grow and improve, it doesn't make sense that it only goes downhill, uh, right? As opposed to like, it, how do we expect leaders to get better and improve if we're not giving them feedback? If, they're not, if you're not asking for feedback as a leader from the people that you lead, how are you going to improve as a leader? You just have to guess and figure it out. That's not a, like, that's not a quick path to growth, um, right? To be like, well, figure it out. And like, hopefully people will tell you things that are honest along the way. Um, as opposed to if we're actually asking for feedback, that's how we learn. It's how we illuminate blind spots and grow. So, cool. I'm gonna share with you a couple things here. Um, the first two, uh, I'm gonna move kind of swiftly through because I think the really important one is the third one. Um, I'm gonna share with you kind of Similar to the SAN culture, but kind of like what I see are kind of like the five tenets of a culture of feedback. So building a healthy culture of feedback, what are the kind of like mindsets and behaviors and ways that we need to approach and think about feedback in order to like have that be really excellent for us. Um, I'm gonna share with you a really, a really simple three question model that I think is really effective for either asking for or giving feedback to somebody else that gives us some parameters and like and is like pretty meaningful questions uh and then i'm gonna share with you another uh, a third piece that is just a really takeaway of how can we have more effective feedback conversations between the two of us uh just as colleagues and human beings so the first piece is also how's everyone doing so far good okay uh good i know i'm talking a million miles an hour but uh i love this stuff so okay so here's here's this uh idea of the, um, yeah, of the five tenets of a culture of feedback. So, and I'm going to kind of speak to each of these. And uh, yeah, number one, I think, is that like the feedback is coaching, or, sorry, feedback is an opportunity, not a threat. Um, and I think this is like kind of the biggest piece that's important for us and like very much tied into growth mindset. Everything about this is growth mindset, right, is that all of us have areas of opportunity to improve. And whether I'm giving feedback to somebody else or somebody else is giving feedback to me, it is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for me to like learn about how I'm impacting somebody else. It's an opportunity for me to highlight and illuminate like blind spots that I have about how I may or may not be aware of how I'm impacting people or showing up. It's also an opportunity more than anything else to build a better, stronger relationship with that person. 
um, even if it's difficult feedback, even if it's a challenging conversation, there's an opportunity there to like build a stronger relationship of, hey, I actually care about you. This conversation is because I care. I want this to feel better between us. I want you to improve. I want me to improve, et cetera. Um, and for us to see feedback as that, it is an opportunity. Even if it's difficult, even if it hurt, hurts to hear, even if you disagree with it, it's still an opportunity to like improve, be better, that relationship or you or us as a team, et cetera. Uh, the second one being that like all feedback has to come from a place of care, concern, and investment in each other's success. If someone is giving me feedback and I feel like they don't actually care about me, if I feel like they're just here to cut me down or point out what I'm doing wrong, right, or I feel like this person is not actually invested in me, they don't care if I fail, I am much more likely to sort of like dismiss that feedback and put no credence into it, right? And just be like, okay, well, you're just saying that because you don't like me and I don't care. Uh, likewise, if somebody is giving me feedback and I feel like genuinely this person cares about me, they truly, honestly, genuinely, sincerely want me to be successful, they're here because they care about me, right, and they're invested and like that's why they're here to have this conversation with me, I am 10,000 times more receptive to that feedback. It's so important that like this is how we approach it and view it collectively as a team, that like that's where the place that we come from. Even if the feedback is tough, and difficult. And most feedback conversations aren't like, hey, this is corrective action, or hey, your job is at stake if this doesn't change. But even if it is, no matter the severity of that conversation, for me, if I'm the one giving that feedback to somebody else, for me to come from a place of care and genuine support and investment in your success. Even if I'm saying a, uh, telling you, hey, if this performance or behavior doesn't turn around, like your job will be at stake. I'm also saying, and also, I don't want that to happen. I want you to be successful. Like, I'm your biggest coach and cheerleader like, and partner in this. How can I support you? How can I help you get you to where you need to be? Because I want you to be here. Like, I want this to be successful for you. And I think it's really important because when that's missing, we take that out of the equation, it's just criticism, it's conflict, right? It's, it's, it's not right, right? It's, it's, it's static. Um, and so important for us to like, be aware of that. Also that feedback is coaching, not criticism that we have a sort of common objective. When I'm giving feedback to somebody else, I'm not a casual observer to like swoop in and just point out all the things that you're doing wrong and how you can improve. It's like we're coming from a place of coaching, uh, which is important, right? It's like if you think about, I, the analogy to me that makes a lot of sense is that if I wanted to go to the Olympics for some sport, long jumping, right? Or any of you wanna like go to the Olympics for some sport that you wanna do. If I just build a pit in my backyard and jump over it every day, I'm not gonna be as effective, right? Or successful as if I hire a coach who's like coached people before that like knows how to do long jump, uh, right? And that's gonna help me by having an outside observer and somebody to like help me grow. And also, if every time that person that I, like that coach gave me feedback of like, hey, keep your head straight or bend your knees this way or whatever, and I took that feedback as a personal attack of like, you don't like me, right? I would never be successful. I wouldn't, because I'm, see, right? My ego is in between me hearing that feedback and understanding it, like, this is how I can improve. Um, and I just, I think that analogy makes a lot of sense to me. It's like that we have to come from a place of coaching, right? That like, I am your biggest coach, cheerleader. I'm, I'm a partner in this. I want you to be successful. That's, that's what I'm here is that like, you and I are together. Um, as opposed to I'm saying, hey, here's all the stuff you're doing wrong, go fix it. I think that we both, when we're delivering feedback or that we're receiving feedback, um, that we can have that awareness about it and that sort of mindset um, and approach to feedback because it's critical. Um, the last two is that uh, more consistent growth uh, requires more consistent feedback. Once a year at a performance review is not often enough to know where we stand as an employee, as part of a team, right? Like we have to have more conversations more often about how are you doing, like, right? Like, we shouldn't be talking about things in feedback conversations or whatever, performance evaluations that happened six months ago or nine months ago. Um, it's way too long. So having more consistent feedback from the people that we're either teaching, if we're faculty, right? From our, like, just from our team, from the people around us, like, more feedback more often is important for us. And yes, you can overdo feedback, right? We don't need to have in-depth feedback conversations once a week, like, stop, um, right? But at least on a consistent basis. For me, I do quarterly check-ins. Yes, I have a performance annual sort of like review with my employees, but it's just another quarterly check-in that happens at the end of the year, um, really for us. And those those conversations help like give feedback. I ask for feedback, right? Really important. And like then we have weekly or bi-weekly, just quick five minute, 10 minute touch bases. How are you doing? How's it going? Are you on track? Do you need anything from me? Um, and then we sit down once a quarter. So like more consistent feedback is important. Um, and the last one here of building a culture of feedback that makes some people squirmy and I don't care is that in a culture of feedback, nobody is exempt. 
if leaders don't ask for feedback and get feedback about how they're doing, like, that's really weird. It's odd. Um, again, how do we expect leaders to improve, right? And, and also, there's a number of benefits to that. But the first one is that, like, when we don't do that as leaders, if we say, right, we're immune to feedback or, like, feedback goes down here, how dare you give me feedback? I'm more important than you because my title is higher than you. What we show and prove as an organization is that, like, feedback is just about power and authority, right, that leaders are infallible and perfect, which is not the case. All of us have areas of opportunity to improve. And as leaders, if we are the ones going and saying, hey, how am I showing up as a leader, right? What are my areas of opportunity to improve? What am I doing well? I'm also modeling for everybody that feedback is healthy and that it's normal. It's how we grow. It's how we improve. It's not about criticism. It's not about power, right? It's about I want to be better. I have a growth mindset. I understand that I'm not perfect. And like I need your outside perspective to help me be better at what I'm doing, whether that is teaching, leading, being part of a team, et cetera. It's really, really, really important. Um, and it's also how we empower people, right? If you want to like empower a group of people, whether they are employees or whatever, we ask them what they think and we actually care, right? We take that feedback to heart to be like, hey, are we doing great as an organization, as a leader? How am I doing? Um, it's how we grow. And if we don't have that feedback, that input, then we just have to figure it out. Um, you know, when these college kids get their first job, they need a lot of feedback. Right? They get feedback in their first jobs. They're like, this is how you operate in the corporate world or in this job. Right? It's like we give a lot of feedback to help people grow. Once you become a leader, you're not more important. You just have a different function and title in the organization. You still need to get feedback. You still need to grow. Um, and, and something else I want to say about this that I think is very poignant, and that is this. A lot of times leaders don't necessarily ask for feedback, or the question comes up, what if somebody gives me feedback that I disagree with or that I hate or that upsets me or that, like, right, or that is wrong, that's false? The reality is this, is that if somebody's giving me feedback, like let's say one of my employees comes to me and they're like, Galen, you're a terrible listener. You never listen to me. It doesn't matter if that is true cosmically. It doesn't matter if I'm a good listener or not. I might think I'm the best listener there is. Everybody else on my team might think I'm the best listener they've ever had as a leader or as a, as a colleague. But the reality is that when somebody's giving me that feedback, what they're telling me is that they don't feel listened to by me. And it doesn't matter what I think about how my, my leadership or whether or not I listen to them. That is true for them, right? And the only appropriate right way to respond to that is to be like, tell me more about that. What does that look like? As a leader, as a human being, I think for all of us, when we get feedback that is like that, somebody is sharing their experience of you, and it's not a lie, right? And like, so instead of me putting any amount of effort into changing your mind or your opinion about what are you talking about? I listen to you all the time, da da da. I put 100% of my energy and effort into changing your experience of me, not your opinion of me, right? Which is what does that look like? When does that happen, right? I'm sorry to hear that. That's not the experience I want you to have of me. So like, if you can think of an example, like let's, I can change that for you. So what does that look like? Tell me more about that so that I can prove that for you. I don't care about whether or not I think I'm a good listener, right? The reality about feedback is that nobody lies downward about feedback, right? I would lie and say that you are a good listener if I don't think you are because I'm afraid to tell you the truth. But if I don't feel listened to by you, if I, if I tell you, hey, I don't feel listened to by you, that's, no one's ever going to lie about feedback like that. It's not like if I do feel listened to, I'm going to say, I don't feel listened to, right? That doesn't make sense. Nobody lies downward. I would say everything's perfect if it's not. But I, if I'm telling you something doesn't feel great to me, that, like no one makes up feedback that's worse than what's true. That doesn't make sense, uh, right? So you know that that is true for that person. And if we care about each other, and we care about being exceptional leaders, we care about the relationships that we have, then anybody having a less than awesome experience of me as a leader, colleague, whatever, I want to know about that, and I want to improve that because I care about those relationships, not my ego. It doesn't matter if I think I'm a good listener. If you're having an experience of me that sucks, I want to know about it because I can improve that for you. And like, I think that's noble, and I think that's like a healthy way of viewing feedback, of moving through the world and being a team. Um, cool. Yeah, good. Uh, does that resonate? Do people like, like that? Does it feel like that's helpful and uh, hopefully like a little bit of a shift or some perspective? Um, cool. Uh, I want to share with you, uh, oh, here's the other thing I want to say about that. When it comes to leaders and feedback, and I know I'm kind of like harping on that, but it's, it's also important. You have to be the one to initiate that conversation. The truth is that people, most people are afraid to give honest feedback to their leaders, uh, right? Most people will quit their job before they go to their leader and tell them the thing that they do that drives them crazy or that they don't like. It's too risky, right? If you're my leader and I'm giving you feedback and I don't know how you're going to respond to it, I will suffer whatever happens or look for a new job and quit before I go to you and say, hey, this thing you do drives me crazy. It's too scary, 
right? Leaders can, in all kinds of creative ways, ruin people's lives, right? And it's not worth it to, for me to damage my relationship with my, my leader if I don't trust 100% that they're going to respond to this well. I'll just put up with whatever forever um, or leave my job. That's what most people do. And for you to, like, I think carry as a badge, as a leader, as a colleague, to be like, you can literally tell me anything, and I will receive it well. I think receiving feedback well is, like, godlike in terms of skills and as a gift to other people to like that you can hear anything and receive it from like a calm neutral place tell me more about that i care about this relationship more than my ego like let's improve that for you it's such a gift um and you have to be the one to sit down and not just tack on to the end of a conversation hey do you have any feedback for me but like actually initiate the conversation to be like this is how i learn this is how i grow how am i doing um yeah good so uh, what I want to share with you next is a kind of like a three simple question model uh, for like giving and receiving feedback that I use that I think is really useful. Um, because if we ask better questions, we get better answers. And these aren't like profound questions, but um, just saying, do you have any feedback for me will never garner great responses because there's no guidelines for that, right? I don't know what you're really asking me. Um, so I really love this model, uh, which is these three things. What am I doing great or what are you doing great? Uh, what are my biggest areas of opportunity to improve? or your biggest areas of opportunity to improve, and what would a 10 out of 10 look like from me or from you? And I use these three questions whether I'm giving feedback or asking for feedback from my team. Uh, so quickly, just to touch on these three, number one, what, do we do, what are you doing great? Um, I know a lot of us have heard the old school like feedback model of like the crap sandwich thing, of, like say something nice to soften the blow, say the real feedback, and then say something nice again to soften the blow. Don't do that, <laughs> it's weird. If we give positive feedback to somebody, it should be genuine and sincere. We should mean it. It's important to point out progress and success, right, and what people are doing well and what we appreciate about them, just as important as it is to point out areas of opportunity. We have to celebrate and acknowledge this is what you're doing great. And for you, as a colleague, as a leader, as a teacher, whatever, it's very important for you to understand what do you do well as a leader? What do people appreciate about you? That's an important part of your self-awareness, uh, right, is that I'm aware of the things that I do well that people appreciate about me. Um, and uh, yeah, the second piece is important, um, which is like biggest areas of opportunity to improve. And I love that language because it's true for all of us. Um, it's important when we're delivering feedback. Uh, this is the like stickiest part that people are the most afraid to say and be honest because we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. We don't want to damage our relationship with that person. We have to be honest. Giving honest, true feedback to people is important. And we have to balance that. We can't just like hide behind being honest to like be mean or cruel, right, or like, or cold to somebody. I'm, even if I'm giving feedback that's hard to hear, I'm still coming from a place of care, concern, and investment, coaching, not criticism, right? It's like, here's this feedback for you. I'm sharing this because I care about a relationship. I see these things getting in your way. I want you to be successful. I'm your biggest partner, coach, cheerleader. What can I do to help you be more successful here? How can I like invest? Um, but to be honest and crystal clear. It's the kindest thing you can do for someone else is give them real feedback. A lot of times we avoid saying the real thing because we are uncomfortable with it, um, but no one should ever, right? And like, of course, very, very few conversations about feedback are like your job is at stake or you're losing your job, right? That's the extreme of it. But the truth is that we have to, as leaders, as colleagues, if we wanna have a healthy culture, we have to have the courage to say the real thing, right? And for someone to hear and I've, this has happened many times. I've coached many leaders about this, uh, right? And like to go to someone and say, hey, if this doesn't change, your job will be at stake. And I also do not want to have that conversation with you. How can I support you? How can I help you? But people need to understand the severity and honestly, like what are you facing? What's going on here? What are the stakes here? Um, it's the kindest thing that we can do, but it takes a lot of courage. And we have to have the courage to be honest. Uh, and we can be honest without being cruel or mean, right? Or cold to people or rude. We can also be like, I want you to be successful. I don't want to ever have a conversation where there's corrective action. Like, let's avoid that altogether. But it needs to look like this. How can I support you, right? How can I help you get you to where you need to be? Because I want you to be here. I want you to be successful. And I genuinely mean that. So important. Uh, and the third question, uh, just share, what would a 10 out of 10 look like for me or from you? I love this question. I've learned more about myself as a leader from asking my employees this question than the other two. Uh, if we just point out, this is what's great. Here are the areas of opportunity. I don't think we get the full kind of spectrum and picture of that. I love that question. Just to be like, paint for me a picture of absolutely exceptional from your perspective. For me to be able to do that for my employees and say, crushing it in your job, a 10 out of 10 looks exactly like this, um, is really, really helpful. Uh, so. Good.
love these three questions. And they're useful for a lot of different ways. I'm also, uh, I will, I've got a couple resources that I'm gonna share and make sure I get sent out to everybody. One that has the three questions and the five tenants, um, as well as the next thing that I'm gonna share with you guys. Uh, there is a resource that sort of has that in a page that's like really kind of comprehensive so that you have access to it. So, um, good. Do people, just temperature check, uh, do people feel like this is valuable? New information, helpful? Okay. Good, and uh, you might have things already in place. I'm always a fan of when you hear other models and things, like take what you like, get rid of the rest, right? Just like there's probably things in here that you can use or implement or put into like what you already have in place. Uh, but I'm always a fan of like adopt it, use language that feels authentic to you, use pieces of this that make sense for you. Um, but feedback, so important. All right, good, so moving right along, uh, my new favorite thing I wanna talk about, uh, which is this, I brought you a donut. I love donuts. I don't actually have donuts in case anyone got excited right there. Um, people like marching in from the side with boxes of donuts. Be like, yeah. So here's where this came from. Uh, and I'll kind of explain what this is about. I was working with the team, doing kind of like feedback work with them, um, doing ongoing culture work with them. And one of the, in one of the conversations that came up, this woman shared this story of like when she, at this previous job, whenever she had to have a difficult conversation with somebody, she would bring them a donut. And so she'd be like, I brought you a donut and like, let's have this difficult conversation. And I was like, that's brilliant. And so this team sort of adopted this collectively as an organization to say, if we have, have to have, there's something that we can designate as a donut conversation, um, which creates some common language for us. And what that means is that if I have a donut conversation that I like, want to have with somebody else, what that means is that I am nervous to have that conversation. I have anxiety because I don't know how you'll react. I have something that's, that's either upsetting me, it's my experiences, you know, whatever. It's just feedback or an observation or something, a conversation that I think you and I need to have, but it gives me anxiety because I don't know how you'll react. And in most organizations, I think in most workplaces, what happens is that we suffer through all kinds of stuff because it's too scary to go and have a real conversation with somebody else, right, who is a colleague, who is a peer, where there's no power, there's no authority at play. You and I are peers, so I don't have any authority to like hold you accountable or like put your job at stake, right? It's like, just like, but this is something that you're doing or that I'm experiencing that bothers me or that I need to give you feedback about or that I want to address. Um, and so, what doesn't exist in most workplaces is a way to do that. Because, A of all, we're not brilliant experts at nonviolent communication and navigating feedback and conflict, right? And nothing I can say in an hour or two hour long workshop is gonna give you that skill. It's a lot, it's a lot of practice, there's a lot of hours, right? There's a lot of skills and tools that like, and none of us get that kind of training. We don't go through school and be like, here's a bunch of like conflict management, navigating and nonviolent communication training. We don't have those skills. And so for me, I'm like, how can I develop something that is like, if you are not a master at these things, how can you still have important conversations effectively in perfect and have them actually work and not be scary. And I think this is like a perfect solution for that, of like something that we can adopt to say, hey, I'm not an expert at this, but I think this is an important conversation. Because when we don't have a method or an opportunity for these kinds of conversations or to resolve static or just issues between us together, then we end up with a lot of dysfunction because those things, right? Then it's like, then the 10th time you do something, now I resent you and I can't stand you because I don't have the courage to go to you the first time or second or third time something bothered me and just say, hey, we need to talk about this. This is my experience here. And so when we don't have the ability to do that, then things escalate, right? They turn into resent, they turn into conflict, or then now we're telling everybody else in the world about this thing that we can't stand about this person because we don't have the courage or the skill to go and actually navigate that with that person and have a real conversation where we could have addressed something right in the, in the infancy of it and eliminated it completely. Um, so here's what this is. It's kind of like a model for having a donut conversation for like, and moving through that. So um, this is kind of the, this is the outline of it. Um, oh shoot, um, it says step number one, step number one, step number one. I forgot to change the slide. I was like, I realized that, and I keep forgetting to change it. So step number one is, is uh, anyways, it's funny, it's a thing. Um, but basically, this is it. A donut conversation is just, the qualifier for that is like, this conversation makes me nervous to have with you because I don't know how you'll react. Um, and so that sort of, Let's me know. The other thing I think that's missing a lot of times from these kinds of conversations, we talk about like, okay, let's improve our skill and giving feedback and these kinds of things. But what's missing is something also really important to that element, which is like asking somebody to receive feedback in a gentle way. 
to understand, I'm nervous to have this conversation with you. Can you receive this in a really gentle, calm, emotionally chill way? Like, can you be not reactive and just hear what I have to say because I'm nervous about saying this to you? I think that's very powerful, right? To be able to be that vulnerable and say, hey, I just, I think this is important um, because I care about you and I care about our relationship. I'm not gonna say this perfectly, but it's important to me. Can you just be gentle and hear it in a gentle way? Um, I think that's a very, very powerful thing. So. The kind of like first step, first piece of, of like, okay, this is a donut conversation, is asking for permission, um, right? Sometimes what we don't want to do is just spring a conversation on somebody where we just like show up and be like, hey, you always do this thing, or right? Like uh, that puts people on the defensive. We don't want to like spring a conversation on somebody if it's like potentially delicate. So like, is this a good time, right? This is, this is a donut conversation. Do you have five minutes? Do you have 15 minutes? Can we sit down and have this conversation, right? Getting a yes, and they're like, yes, I'm in that space. Yes, I can be, is really important to sort of like be like, okay, let's move through this. Um, and then the second piece, step number two, is just say the thing, right? As best as possible, but not perfectly. Just this is my experience. This is my observation. This is what's happening for me. This is the feedback I want to share with you, um, right? Just like say it in a gentle way, but just be direct and actually say the real thing. And then listen. Right? Another piece of that is like, I want to get your perspective. What do you think about that? When you hear that, what is your response to that? How do you feel about this? Right? This is a collaborative, both of us and both of our perspectives matter here, conversation. So like, what do you think about that? Please share with me. Tell me what you think um, is important. Uh, and also, second bullet point in here too is like, if you're a fan of Brene Brown, I am. She has a, a, a way of sort of like, I have these assumptions. A lot of times if we have static or something's going on, we assume this is why I'm assuming why you did this thing or I'm assuming what's going on here. It's nice to be able to be like, this is the story that I'm telling myself. I don't know that it's true, but this is sort of an assumption that I'm making and a narrative that I've created in my brain. I don't believe that it's true, but I just want you to understand kind of where I'm coming from. Um, and I think that can be really useful language. So, and then the third piece, which is also the first piece um, because of my bullet points is just to like validate, clarify, resolve, right? So if Robert's coming to me saying, hey, Galen, I've got this donut conversation I want to have, here's this thing, right? When after he's done sharing, then just like repeat. Thank you so much, appreciate that. Let me repeat back what I heard you say. This is what's happening, this is the feedback, here's your experience, is that right? Is that accurate, did I hear you correctly? Right, and be like, yes, cool. And be like, here's my perspective, right? Same thing, I'll share, he'll repeat back to me. This is what you said, this is how you feel, is that right? Yes, boom. And now we both sort of like have felt listened to and we can sort of find this resolution together in a calm, neutral, like productive way. Um, it's beautiful, right? Because a lot of times what happens is if I'm not able to have this conversation with a peer, then things get escalated. Then I go to HR, I go to somebody else, we escalate it up the chain because I don't, I'm afraid to have this conversation with you directly. And I think in most organizations, if we could have these conversations together productively, then things don't blow out of proportion. We can have them early, and there's some guardrails for us to be like, here's an effective way that we can have this conversation that's potentially dicey, knowing that like both of us can be gentle about this and be like, let's put the relationship first. Let's find a resolution to this, right? Let's feel heard and listen to, which resolves 90% of all conflicts, is to be like, tell me where you're coming from. What is your experience? How do you feel? I, I hear you, I listen to you. Um, that goes a long way in just being like, okay, cool, this person understands how I feel, and I've said what I really mean, and they received it well. So, um, cool, I love this model, I think it's great. I would encourage you to sort of like adopt this and like, right, practice. The couple things I wanna share about this too, last piece. Uh, two more helpful things. Number one, you will not be perfect at this. So if this is like, okay, cool, on my team and my department, let's adopt this, you're not gonna do it perfectly. And that's kind of like also the point of it, is that we're not masters and experts at giving and receiving feedback and navigating conflict. So as imperfectly, but as well-intentioned as possible, let's try to go through it and learn. Right? Having one or two good experiences with something like this will give you confidence and some skills and be like, oh, this is actually a way that I can navigate static with somebody else uh, effectively um, and also imperfectly, which is great. Uh, and like employing some compassion, some empathy, right? Let yourself off the hook. You don't have to be perfect at this. Um, and put the relationship first. That's the key, right? Is that like, this relationship matters to me. You matter to me. That's why I'm bringing this up to you. And yeah, I'm nervous about it. So like, let's move through this. Uh, and the second piece, this is something I think is so valuable. I started using this in like lots and lots and lots of conversations in like my personal friendships, romantic relationships with my team, but a severity scale is a really, really helpful thing to add when it comes to feedback because a lot of feedback is uh, qualitative, 
I'm saying, hey, I'm frustrated by this thing from you. But there's, it's really hard to sort of pinpoint how frustrated, right? It's so qualitative. So for us to give a quantitative number of like, hey, on a scale of one to 10, this is like a three for me. It's not that big of a deal. Or this is important. This is like a nine out of 10. This is like an eight or nine out of 10 for me. I'm very emotionally fired up, I'm frustrated, right? It's really nice to be able to sort of quantify that for somebody else. And I think a lot of times that's why also feedback conversations are difficult because we as polite, passive people like to be like, oh, here's this thing, but it's no big deal. And something might actually be a nine or a 10 for me, but I don't want to damage this relationship. And so I say, it's no big deal, it's fine, I'm not, right? But it is. And this also helps us not wiggle out of what's true and say, right, and to commit to saying, hey, this is actually like an eight or nine for me. Like I'm actually very frustrated about this thing and we need to talk about it. That's why I'm here. Um, and it's important for us to be able to do that. Also, what we're afraid of with feedback is something isn't that big of a deal to me, but somebody thinks it is. And I don't want something that is like a one or a two or a three out of 10 for me in terms of like, it's a big deal. I don't want someone to think that it's an eight or a nine and think that I'm like pissed at them or that they're failing at their job or that I hate them, right? And that's really important to say, hey, Truly, on a scale of one to 10, this is like a two. It's a blip on the radar, it's not a big deal, but I wanted to bring it up now, right, so that you're aware of it and we can have this conversation. I think that's a really, really helpful thing to do so that you and I are on the same page. Nobody's assuming that this is more important than it is or that it's less important than it is. Um, I think it's a really, really helpful tip. And that's like, you can take that to all of your relationships and all of your conversations that are challenging, especially in like partnerships. Uh, it's so helpful to be like, hey, this is like a three for me. It's not a big deal, but I want to bring it up. Um, cool. Great. Uh, okay. That is the donut conversation thing, um, which again, I've got a resource that is just a one page that sort of breaks down the severity tip, the, like the, the three steps, it, they are numbered properly uh, in the resource. Um, so yeah, but I guess just like taking a pause um, before kind of like moving on, but I'm curious for like thoughts, questions, feedback, I think there's like a little bit of opportunity, but I'd love to just take everyone's temperature. Do we feel like for this, the conversation about feedback, do you feel like this is helpful or like new useful things for you? Um, okay, good. Any questions, any sort of like thoughts, comments, experiences? I just want to like, we have a little bit of space and I like to not just like, I talk the whole time, but I'd love to hear. Yeah, sure. Right, of course. Yeah, and a lot of times it doesn't have to be a single conversation. That's also nice, right? To be like, hey, there's this ongoing thing or you and I have some like relationship that we need to repair and like this isn't just a one and done, we fix everything between us. We've got history of like, okay, we don't love each other as coworkers, but like, so sometimes, a lot of times, this is sort of an ongoing conversation. Be like, hey, let's start the conversation. Let's just share with each other. Let's come back, let's check in in a week or something and like, right, it doesn't have to be, we solve it right now. We find a resolution right now. It can just be like, hey, I'm open to can I show up differently here? Can we make this better or some way? And so like leaving that open, not feeling like we have to a finite, well, we're in, in 20 minutes, we're gonna solve this history that we have between us. Just like, I'm open to the conversation, let's start the conversation, right? And I think something else you bring up too is this very, this is very kind of based on like a sort of like format of like mediating things. And the one most helpful thing you can do in the world is whether it's for three minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes is let someone just share and talk without interjecting, without making comments, without nodding your head, without making a bad face, just without reacting at all, just being in a space of listening. And for you, like I truly feel like that's, it's such a high level of emotional intelligence, of understanding about how to like navigate and move through conflict and stuff with people is that like, if I'm asking you to share, I will not make comments, I won't be like at all, I just, you talk, 
for five minutes or however long it takes. And when you're done, I'll say, okay, this is what I heard you say. And just repeat back. This is your perspective. This is what's happening. This is what you're frustrated about. Is that right? Did I hear you right? Just the ability to do that and have two people do that with each other, it's so powerful. Literally, it will just like dissipate most all of the conflict between the two of you. Just be like, I felt listened to. This person genuinely cares about me, which goes back to that bullet point, right, in the feedback piece, which is this person actually has good intentions, wants to make this better, cares about me as a person, um, even though we are in sort of conflict or static with each other. So important. Something else I want to say, too, that I think uh, that sort of like sparks in me is a reframe of conflict that I sort of adopted for myself years ago. I heard this, and it like completely changed my, I was like, oh, this is brilliant, was that a lot of times we think about having conflict with somebody else or static with somebody else. We think of like the two of us in the ring against each other, right? We think of it as a battle of like, okay, we're going to battle it out. Somebody wins, somebody doesn't. It's like, blah, 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 blah. and I love this this sort of shift in that is thinking about when you and I have conflict, it's actually you and I in the ring against this problem, um, right? That like you and I together are together like battling out with this thing, trying to like it's you and I against this issue or challenge. And even to the extreme, even if the conflict that we have is that you and I don't like each other and we don't work well together, and right? Is that like still, how can you and I come together to solve that issue. The challenge is that we don't really get along, we have different communication styles, but how can we still effectively work together, right, and exist in harmony together even though we're very different, that we have history, and like how can you and I collaboratively be like, okay, that's true, how can we overcome that together? And I think to see conflict as a collaborative, it's you and I against this challenge that we have, um, is a, is a really important reframe <laughs> to be like, we're on the same team, even though like you and I are battling. It's like this, right? This, it's the issue is between the two of us and it's, and it's personal or whatever. Um, so good, love it. I appreciate the comment. Any other thoughts, questions, feelings just about the three question model? Oh yeah, yeah, you had a hand. Sure. Right? So you have to be kind of aware that you have that awareness that you're contributing to uh, if somebody says something like this, you're holding the third more are they, which is kind of garbage. Yeah. Yeah, and, and body language, all that's right, it does matter. If, if this is a delicate conversation, for me to feel listened to, again, it was what we kind of talked on yesterday, to make somebody feel listened to uh, is different. And me showing up in a way where it's like, my intention is to make you feel heard and make you feel listened to, which means I'm not distracted, I'm not on my phone, I'm not sort of half paying attention, uh, right? My body language really matters. And I think it's also okay if we can do it in a gentle way to be like, hey, this is kind of important. Can, can we have this conversation when I can have all of your sort of like, focus and attention, right? Like, I don't, I'm not telling you what to do, but if you're too busy to like do this right now, can, can we have this at a moment when like you can just focus and sort of tune in? Um, because, right, like, you know, I know that's also delicate, but asking someone to be like, hey, this is what I need from you right now. And if you can't provide that, that's okay. We'll have this conversation another time. But like, I would love it if you could just really kind of tune in and like give me your just body language and eye contact just to feel listened to. Like, again, I think if we can have the courage to gently move through conversations like that that are difficult or ask what we need for, right? I'm, I'm like, I'm saying vulnerably, can you hear this feedback in a gentle way? That's what I need is to not, don't be reactive. You know, this might be upsetting to you and we don't have to even resolve this conversation today, but I have this thing I wanna sh share with you that makes me feel nervous. And like, can you just hear it in a gentle way? Um, because I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who's like, no. Right? Right? That's what we're asking for. It's like, hey, can you just hear this in a gentle way? This is difficult to say, and I'm not going to say it perfectly, but like, it's important to me. So, is that okay? Do you have space for that? Um, I think someone just saying yes and granting permission for that automatically, that like puts us in a space of like, okay, I get the context here. Yes, I can be aware of my own reaction, how I'm showing up, my body language, et cetera. So, 
good. And these types of things, if this isn't how you do conflict or conversations or whatever, it's not new to you. It's unfamiliar, um, which means that you won't do it perfectly. It's not ingrained in you. But practicing, having the courage to try these kinds of things, I think, will, like, you know, one or two good successful events uh, where you'll learn through the process and, like, feel more confident about, like, uh, I mean, it's, it really truly is a place where you can level yourself up to be like, I have the skill to have challenging conversations with people, right, and do it in a way that's gentle and, and productive. Um, but I think that's a, that's a level to shoot for as a human being because it really benefits your life, your work life, right, all your relationships uh, in my mind. So, okay, great. How's everyone doing? Good. I want to end on, uh, we're going to do one last activity, just like shift gears. So, uh, again, I will share these, these resources with you so they're like the three questions, the tenets, all that kind of stuff as well just as a takeaway. But uh, we're going to do one last activity I love to end on. I think of all the things I do with teams, this is probably one of my favorite ones. And because of the setup of the room in here, it's going to be kind of chaotic. Uh, but we're going to do it and, and, and it's going to be fine. So here's what I need everyone to do uh, is to get in a giant circle around the outside of the room. Um, so yeah, we're going to, yeah, just do that. I'll explain what we're going to do. I also, uh, I have an idea. Um, okay. Do, 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 do. Okay. Here's, here's what we're going to do. This is, an, uh, this is an unwieldy amount of people to play this game with. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, so we're going to learn this game as a full circle around the room, and then what we're going to do is break off into smaller circles around the room. And again, you're smart people. You can figure out how to get into a circle even though the rooms look like this. Uh, I guarantee it. But we're going to learn it as a full group, and then we'll break off into small circles so that we can play it with speed. But this is the easiest way to teach it to a large group of people. So uh, here we go. Um, we're, this game is called Zip Zap Zoom. And uh, here's how it works. And also, if some of you are like camp people or you've like activity and you've played Zip Zap Zoom before, there's a lot of versions of it. This is probably different than the one you know. So still pay attention. Um, not be like, oh, I know this game. Because there's a lot of different ways to play it. So here's how it works. We're basically, as a group, we're just sending a couple different words around the circle. Uh, and each word we send a little bit differently. So we'll start by learning the first word, the first piece of this game, which is zip. And the way that we pass the zip around the circle is you, I'm going to, Put the mic down for a second so it's like clear. But you like look at the next person in the circle, clap like one hand through the next, and say the word zip out loud of your mouth. It looks like this. Zip. Cool. <laughs> um, so, uh, and how it goes around the circle is it just goes around in order, person to person. It doesn't change direction. It doesn't do anything fun or funny or clever. Uh, it just goes around the circle. And also, we play this game as quickly as we can. So uh, when it's coming around the circle, I'm not like, Zip. Like, as soon as it got, like, it's quick. I'm not like, take my time and be like, okay, zip. And also, you can see it coming because it's moving around the circle. So be ready so that when it gets to you, you can like react very quickly. So it shouldn't take like a minute to get around the circle one time. It's very, very fast. We play as fast as we can. Also, don't accidentally like punch your neighbor. So just like be cool. Um, but yeah, okay. So we're going to start with that first piece. Um, and then we'll add the other pieces after that. So uh, here we go. First time around, zip. Flawless. <laughs> Flawless. Um, honestly, a little slow, but we're fine. Everything's great. We'll pick up speed. It's fine. Everything's fine. Um, okay, so the second piece of this game is the zap. And the zap looks like this. Um, if the, what is your name? Jamie. Jamie. Okay, so if the zip is coming around the circle and Jamie gives it to me, I can send the zip forward like we just did, right? If it's coming one direction. Or I can zap her, in which case she will turn and send the zip the other direction. So it's basically a reverse card in Uno. 
It changes, it doesn't change into zap, it's a one-time event, it changes the direction of the zip in the circle. And anybody can zap as many times as you want, it's just like, poof, immediately we just change direction. So we're gonna add that second piece, try it. It's not gonna make it all the way around, it never does, it's okay, um, but just for like learning and watching purposes, um, we get to see it. So we'll add that second piece, the zip and the zap. Um, again, still pretty quickly, here we go, zip. Okay, good, 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 good. Uh, the game moved past you while you guys were trying to figure out what was happening. It was like earlier. So, okay, good. So, that is the zap. Um, and the third piece of this game, which is zoom. And the zoom can go anywhere in the circle at any time. And so, what that looks like is this if the zip is coming around, I can either send the zip forward, I can zap here, or I can zoom across the circle to somebody else. Um, so, uh, yeah, and what is your name? James, okay, uh, James. Uh, so if James sends the, across the circle to me with the zoom, I have a couple different options. I can either send the zip out in either direction, keep it going, I can zoom somewhere else in the circle, or technically, I can zap his zoom, which puts it back on him and he has to make a different choice. So, here's what I wanna say about this game and everything that you will do for the rest of your entire lives. I promise you that we are going to screw this game up People are going to say the wrong word, do the wrong thing, make a mistake, and screw up the game. I think we already had like, uh, a play, like one or two where like somebody said the wrong thing. So, in the interest of improv, yes and, everything we talked about to yesterday, uh, and also how we play this game, is that if James sends it across the circle to me, and he says zip instead of zoom, I know what he meant. Because he looked at me and he clapped and he said a word out of his mouth. My job is to accept his offer, make him look good, and continue to play the game. When, we, when somebody makes a mistake, we do not pause, we don't stop, I don't have to point out he makes a mistake, I don't be like, what are you doing, you can't serve like none of that happens. <laughs> we don't laugh at him, he doesn't have to apologize to the group, we don't restate the rules of the game, we just continue to play. Everyone is trying to say the right word and do the right thing, but people will make mistakes, and that's okay, we just incorporate those mistakes and continue to move forward, that's really important about how we play this game. So, a quick review, of all three uh, words, we'll play it just for a moment for the big circle with all three just to see it in practice and then we'll break up into small circles so that we can like play at speed. So zip is the first piece, just goes around in order, person to person. Zap is a one-time event, puts it back on that person, they have to make a different choice and zoom can go anywhere in the circle at all. So um, with all three of those active and also remember like go quickly, you can see it coming, anticipate it could come to you at any second. So like look alive uh, and move quickly. Uh, ready? Here we go. Zoom. Yeah, oh, question, time out, sorry, time out, time out, stop, stop, stop. Either way, you can zip it out in either direction, you can zoom somewhere else, or you can zap that person. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, are we ready? Uh, okay, here we go, zoom. Okay, good, that's great, that's great. So, um, perfect. So, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, you're gonna figure this out. Um, you're gonna get into a group of people, about eight to 10 people. So like the exact number is not uh, perfect, it doesn't matter. Um, find a way to get into a circle um, with your eight to 10. So like moving around tables or like figure it out, but get into a circle with eight to 10 people. Uh, and once you have a circle together, um, you can start it off. So, uh, yeah. Perfect. That's great. Uh, good, good, good. Find a circle, jump into it. Exact number of people is not totally critical. Okay, cool. Perfect. Great job. Once you have a circle, uh, send it off. Go.
That's great, that's great, that's great. You can pause, 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 pause. Um, all right, uh, here we go. So here's what we're going to do. Um, with your circles, uh, one person uh, is going to stay in your circle. Everybody else is just going to, like, scatter. So, like, go to a different circle. We're just going to, like, just scatter groups. We're just going to mix up the groups in the room. So one person stay. Everybody else, like, quickly go find another group. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is great. This is great. It works. Yeah. Um, yeah, these, these guys need a couple more. Doo, doo, doo. Cool. Lovely. And like, you know, six or seven people, just add a couple more people here. Uh, just like donate a couple people to this group. Or you guys just disseminate. A couple growing here. Yeah, good. Okay, great. Perfect. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I know that you feel like you are playing this game as fast as you can. I promise you that you are not. Um, that's not criticism. I'm just, uh, you can play faster. So we're going to keep exactly the same rules. You're just in a new team. But I want you to play twice as fast as you just played the first time around. So what that means is don't think, just react, right? All we care about is like moving the, the zip, zap, zoom around the circle as quickly as possible. You're going to make mistakes. It does not matter. Don't pause. Don't stop the game and like figure it out. Just like keep going, uh, right? Twice as fast as you just did. Exactly the same rules. Um, okay, ready? Go. Send it off. Okay, good, 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 good. That's great, that's great. Uh, we'll pause, we'll pause. Um, all right, uh, so third and final time. Um, oh, wait, you guys are still going. Uh, third and final time, one more time, just like scatter, one person stay. Uh, new groups, totally mix it up. Uh, just totally different people. Find a new group. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you three can combine or come into this group or whatever. It's totally cool. Yeah, that's great. All right. Uh, so third group, final group, here's what we're going to do. Everything is exactly the same. I'm not changing the rules at all. Now you've played it two different times. You're more familiar. So here's what you're going to do for like a short window of time, 20, 25 seconds, 30 seconds. You're going to play as fast as you absolutely can. Um, so whatever pace you were playing it before, you're just going to go even faster, which means do not think, just react, be present. Um, like the only thing that matters is passing the words around the circle, person, person, person. That is it. So as fast as you possibly can, exactly the same rules. Um, so just like be present, ready to go. Uh, all right, when I say go, um, you go for like, like I said, 25, 30 seconds, that's it. So ready? Three, two, one, go. Okay, good, 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 good. That's great, that's great. Uh, everybody, give, your, give the rest of your team a hand for being awesome. Cool. Uh, you can all come back and have a seat. Uh, have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. Um, that was great. Good job.
All right. Oh, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, so I just want to take uh, the last kind of few minutes that I have here with all of you um, to just sort of, I want to break that down a little bit. I think of all the things I do with teams, adults, uh, games that I play, exercises, or whatever, I think this one is like maybe the most important. I love it. Um, I know it's just like seemingly sort of innocuous games, zip, zap, zoom, whatever. But there's a lot of things happening here, and I want to be able to talk about this. Um, and that is, that is this. In improv, and from the five tenets of improv yesterday, we talked about saying yes, making other people feel, look good, uh, right? To like be listened, be present, embrace change and failure, be positive. We talk a lot in improv for specifically about embracing failure um, and embracing mistakes and that kind of thing. And I want to sort of like unpack that a little bit here for the context of as we think about how we operate as a team, right? And the dynamics of how we treat each other. I think it's like there's something here that I think is really powerful. And when, you know, when we talk about, I think when people hear the idea of like embracing failure, what we think of that as when we make, when we have mistakes, we make mistakes or we have failures, we just sort of just take it easy on ourselves and sort of move on, right? Like, and that is an element of it. But for us as improvisers, and I think in this context of like how we operate as a team, when we say embracing failure, what that means for us as improvisers is that we understand that if we set out to do anything in the world, no matter what it is, the one thing we can guarantee from start to finish is that something will go wrong. Some unexpected circumstances will like will knock us off path or like arise. We'll have some failure, some change, some thing, right? And like that is true your whole life. It's been true your whole life as a human being. And you know that if you set out to do anything, you want to build something at home, you want to roll out some new system or software at work or anything, like you can guarantee that from start to finish something is going to go wrong. Something will be measured wrong, ordered wrong, cut wrong. Somebody will drop the ball. Like some technology will break for no reason at all because that's what technology does. It's infuriating, right? Like something is going to go wrong. And the bigger the quest, the bigger the thing that we set out to do, right, the grander it is, the more <laughs> not only like can we guarantee that's going to happen, but like at least more than once um, for us. And so what that means for us is that we know that is a guarantee. It is part of the process. We know that things are going to go wrong. We know that we're going to have unexpected circumstances. We know we're going to make mistakes. We know that we're going to have failures. And we don't know what they will look like, and we don't know when they will show up. But as soon as they do, we're like, oh, that. We pick up the ball, and we continue to move forward. It does not derail us, right? And so I think one of the things that we're up against as human beings, as adults, <laughs> is that we're obsessed with mistakes. We're obsessed with not making mistakes. We're obsessed when somebody else makes a mistake that we point it out, uh, right? Like, it is, is something that, like, it's debilitating. If you get a group of five-year-olds in a room and you teach them a game, everybody wants to play. They only feel like they win if they get more turns than anyone else. But you get a group of adults in a room and teach them a game, and, like, they're very timid, right? This is why if we started yesterday with, like, let's create a brand-new sport out of thin air, it would have been quiet and weird and awkward because we are, we are, afraid of being imperfect, of making a mistake, of not looking great, right, in front of our peers and other people because of, like, how much we criticize and pounce on people for being imperfect. And in this game, if we were to measure our success as a team, right, in the Sib Zap Zoom game, by the amount of times that we pass the word from person to person around the circle, we're more successful, we're more efficient, we're more productive, we get more done if we just incorporate mistakes. When somebody makes a mistake, we don't stop the game, we don't make a big deal, we just continue to move forward and go, right? Like, and there's a parallel here. I'm not saying mistakes are cool. Let's be sloppy and who cares about the work that we do? Like who, Galen said we can make mistakes. So like who cares about the quality of work that we do? It's not that, right? In everything that we do, we strive to be exceptional. We strive to be perfect, to make no mistakes, right? To be exceptional, truly, in everything that we do, in what we deliver and how we operate, everything. But we also understand at the same time that this is life. Things go wrong. We have unexpected circumstances. We have stuff, COVID, whatever, right? Or individual things that, like, it is a natural part of the human ex experience that you will screw up, that other people will screw up, that things will go wrong. And we can hold those two things to be true at the same time, that we're striving to be perfect and exceptional and also allowing that, like, that's not really what's going to happen. We don't know when and how and what, but things are not going to go perfectly for us along the way. And that proactive mentality says we already know that. So when something goes wrong, when we have mistakes or setbacks, and we're not like, oh, like, I can't believe it. It's like, yeah, of course, of course. It's such a natural part of anything, anything we set out to do. Like, it's just an element of that. It's part of the process. And the other part of this that I think is the most important is that there's another layer there about this game and this work and this conversation that is so important about how you show up together as a team and as an organization. 
and that is around our culture. If we have a culture to where if James sends it across the circle to me and he says zip instead of zoom, and I'm like, nope, you can't zip across the circle. You can only zoom across the circle. You can zip left and right. I've already said that like four times, right? Which is hilarious, but how truly, how different is that from how we actually show up and respond to people when they prove to be imperfect and inhuman? We piranha people for making a mistake and being imperfect. We pounce on them, right? To the point of when we start playing this game in the first one or two circles that you have, when somebody makes a mistake, the whole game stops so they can apologize for 10 seconds and be like, oh, ha, ha. nobody cares that you made a mistake. But you watch other adults be like, oh, 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 they, right? Like we have to apologize. We have to be like, I'm, I, I'm not that mistake. That mistake, oh my God, like what, it, no one cares. You made a mistake. It has no consequence inside this game. But still, we watch adults stop the game and pause and feel embarrassed and be like, nobody cares. All we want to do is play. Let's go, right? The times that you feel like someone stopped the game because they made a mistake, we're like, it doesn't matter. Send it. Like, let's go, right? Let's do it is. Um, and if that is our culture, right, to one where James says across the circle, I call him out, da da then here's the result of that then I can be standing in the circle playing this game along with everybody else and also hoping that nobody sends it to me, right? I, I'm not going to remember all the stupid words. I'm going to say the wrong stupid thing. I don't want to play. Nobody in the universe can thrive in that environment, in that culture, where I'm like coming from a place of criticism, of reluctance, of fear, of judgment, of you, of myself, right? Nobody in that environment, in that culture will take a chance, will raise their hand, will do something, will take a risk. All I will do is toe the line and be invisible so I don't get pounced on by everybody else by being imperfect. And the opposite of that is if our culture is one to where I know, right, that if I make a mistake, every single person in this room will make me look good, will have my back, right, will like make me look good in that moment and like, right, and I also choose as an individual person, as part of this team, as part of this organization, that like I will absolutely, if any one of you drop the ball, make a mistake, I will make you look good and I will, I will have your back unequivocally, without question. I don't care if it's my job description, I don't, I don't care. I've got your back and that is like absolutely, you can count on that 100%. That is what being a team is about. And if that is our culture, the only thing all of us need to do is like show up, participate, and give our best, right? Knowing that everybody here has my back. I also show up proactively like every other person in this room. Let's go, right? It's like now, it's like we're not going to be perfect, but let's be awesome together, right? Let's em embrace that because then me being creative, taking a chance, showing up, like all of me can actually show up here and give the best that I have to give. My creativity, my collaboration, my engagement completely comes to the surface when I understand that you all have my back and I also show up the same way. There's also something here that is another layer of that that's important and that is this. If James sends it across the circle to me and he says zip instead of zoom, I know that he made a mistake. In the moment, he may or may not know that he made a mistake. And I have the opportunity right then in that moment to extend him some grace. I don't have to point out that he made a mistake. I don't have to make him feel stupid, right? Especially in front of anyone else. I can choose to extend him some grace because when I am the person who makes the mistake, right, who does the thing, that's what I want from every person here is to extend me some grace. All of us will imperfectly make mistakes and do things. And in private, if I need to, have a conversation, right? Again, it's not about do whatever you want, be sloppy, make mistakes. We don't care, right? It's like we can address things, have conversations if we need to, if they're important. But I can choose, especially when there are zero consequences, that in that moment in front of anyone else, there is no way I would call you out or make you feel bad or look bad at all. I would never do that. I would never violate that trust of how we operate as a team. And I think it's such a powerful thing that we can adopt and like for yourself as you move through this world is look for those opportunities to extend people some grace, to not pounce on them, right? To like have that moment. And that is the kind of thing that does not fall from the sky. We have to choose that. Every person here has to be like, I will take ownership to do that. I will extend grace, I will make people look good, right? I'll show up and like, and my intention is to bring the best out of you, to make you feel at home, right? To make you feel like you can share your voice matters. You and I don't have to be best friends. We don't have to agree. We can have conflict together. And I still am right here to be like, you tell me more about that. Where are you coming from, right? That is such a powerful thing. You own that. All of you in this room can do that. Regardless of how anybody else shows up around you, like that is something you can adopt for yourself. And for us collectively as an organization, as a team, to say this is how we operate, these are the rules of engagement for us, this is our culture, is so powerful. Who would not want to work in an organization like that? Get out of here, right? It's like that's what we want, is for us to be more intentional. We are not going to be perfect. Um, work is messy. 
it's people, it's, it's right, we have history, there's all kinds of things. Um, but like we as a team collectively can be really intentional about what does it mean to be here, right, and be committed to that, take ownership of that, and show up that way. And like all that does is make this a better experience for every single person here in this room, in this organization, and for what we do, your mission, right? Educating, like delivering education, like serving kids and youth, like, right? Like getting people prepared for the world and like delivering excellent like education, like that is your mission. And if you are tight and solid and awesome as a team, that goes up, right? We just do that more effectively. We have more impact in what we're doing here. And who wouldn't, who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want to be like, let's be a soft place to land for each other. Let's be intentional about our culture. Yes, we acknowledge work is messy. People are messy, right? None of this is perfect stuff, but we can like level up what it means to be here in a massive way, and we have 100% control over that, right? Higher ed, there's a lot of things that are, right? It's been a challenging, tough year. Like these last couple of years, COVID, it's, it's very difficult, but we can have control over what it feels like to be here, right? And we can be a soft place to land for one another as we go through this, navigate this time together, right? Arm in arm, lockstep to be like, this is who we are as a team. And like, that's, it's such a powerful thing, but we have to choose it. It's like, that doesn't, that's not like, okay, leadership does that. It's every person in this room to be like, this is how I will show up. And that we collectively take ownership, and I think it's powerful. Um, so, good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I know that it is time uh, to, like, wrap things up, so I don't want to keep you any longer. But I appreciate everybody be engaged, doing these things. I hope that there's pieces of this that you can kind of take away, some of these nuggets. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's been a treat. So have a great year. Uh, thank you guys all. So yeah, appreciate it. <laughs>